Okay, in the second half of uh, part two for this chapter, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, specific types of bonds, try to get away from, uh, not totally away from uh, the numbers, but uh, we'll uh, um, move on to some more uh, uh, terminology types of things, if you will. So the first thing we want to talk about, the next thing is we want to talk about um, different features that you can find in a bond. There are basically two different uh, types of bonds. These are actually different types of bonds. One's called a conversion bond. And a conversion or a convertible bond allows bondholders to change each bond into a stated number of shares of common stock. And of course, you're only going to do this when it makes sense, when you're going to get a higher rate of return or when it seems best for you. But in general, uh, you might want to become an owner if the company uh, has some potential. If they uh, start growing fairly rapidly, you want to take advantage of some of the growth opportunities within the company. And of course, creditors don't share in any of the profits or the growth. Um, so you may want to switch from being a bond holder to a equity holder. The call feature is really looked at from the corporate side. This is what allows uh, companies to refinance their debt. Uh, if you remember, you have a contract for, let's say, 30 years, and the company can't force you to sell that contract to them if you don't want to sell it to them. However, if the bond has a call feature, the company can force you to pay back the debt or sell them back your debt, if you will, at a certain price the call price it's the stated price at which the bond can be repurchased and usually it's purchased with something called a call premium um, the call premium is the amount by which the bonds call price exceeds its par value for instance frequently the call price will be the par value plus one year's interest so let's see what one of these uh, might look like and how we might look at the returns. Here we have a 12% coupon bond, pays interest annually, par value of 1,000, 25 years left, and has a 10% required return. So you see the value of this bond currently is 1181, but this bond has a price of uh, 1050. So its current yield to maturity calculated out is 11.39. And of course, as you can tell from this, uh, you wouldn't, um, um, the required return is 10%, the yield to maturity is higher, so you would want to buy this bond. But it's a callable bond. Down below, there's a place where we can input the call premium, or the call uh, price, and the years to call. So in this case, you're going to be able to sell this for uh, they'll give you $1,120 for this bond at the end of 10 years. If they did that, the yield to call would be 11.81. So again, the, the yield is greater than the current required return. So this is a good investment. And in fact, you're going to hope that the company actually calls the debt. You get an extra half a percent if they call in 10 years uh, via this call premium. What you essentially have to hope for then is you have to hope that interest rates fall far enough so that refinancing is an option for the company. Next, what about different grades of bonds or types of bonds? Uh, there are two companies primarily out there that do this, Moody's and Standard & Poor's. Uh, I think Standard & Poor's are a little bit easier to follow, but Moody's is, is very popular as well. High-grade bonds are AAA and AA rated bonds. Essentially, what we're looking at here is the chance of default. So high-grade bonds have the least chance of default. Medium-grade bonds for the S&P 500 or for the S Standard & Poor's is, are A-graded bonds or triple B bar bonds. And again, there's a more of a chance, it's more susceptible to some changing uh, standards, and capacity to pay is there, so they can play, 
But there are some things and situations that could happen that could make the cash flow somewhat uncertain. Lower grade bonds typically are considered speculative. Sometimes we would refer to those as junk bonds, if you've heard that phrase before. But any of these bonds, the double Bs through the double C here, uh, are speculative. There's, there's, a, there's a chance that these bonds won't uh, pay uh, any of the uh, interest and or principal. In fact, once you get to the C and the D bonds, uh, these are actually bonds where there's, they're either in default because of principal or they're income bonds and there's no interest being paid on those in income bonds. So again, the rating system is basically a measure of the chance of default. So let's talk about different types of bonds. Obviously the government issues debt. We refer to state and local government debt as municipal securities. Um, the risk varies dependent on the type of uh, entity that's issuing the debt, but typically interest received is tax exempt from the federal level. So if you think about this, I mean, if you have high, if you're in a high tax bracket, you would like to buy municipal securities because you don't pay federal taxes on this. Now, interest is frequently paid at the state level unless you actually live in the state that issued this. So uh, these could actually have no tax at all. If you excuse me, if you buy the municipal bonds from the state in which you live, treasury securities are obviously federal government debt. We have T bills that are very low uh, maturity, one year or less. Treasury coupons or uh, treasury notes are typically coupon debt. They're typically we refer to them as one to ten years. And then treasury bonds are those types of instruments that typically have a length of time or maturity that's greater than 10 years up to a maximum of 30 years for government bonds. There are things called zero coupon bonds. They pay no interest. So the entire yield to maturity comes from capital gains. Um, these bonds will never sell for more than their par, par value and typically treasury bills and uh, United States savings bonds are good examples of what zeros are. They pay no interest up front. Um, <clears throat> bond markets are primarily over-the-counter transactions. Uh, there are some exchanges, but they're rather small. Most of the action happens over-the-counter. Um, the, there are a lot of bond issues, but the actual trading of shares is actually low. So there's not a lot of activity in the bond market, even though there are a great number of bond issues that are available. Uh, sometimes, especially for smaller companies and municipal debts, uh, it's difficult to get up-to-date prices because they just don't trade that frequently. <clears throat> so how do we recognize or how do you read the quotes for a bond so we're going to work our way through here and talk about how we do this and ultimately how you would read the bond rating uh, system here how you would get across to that so let's think about this so what is the bonds coupon rate the bonds coupon right here is 8.375 right um, oops, I'm sorry. The company we're looking at is ABC. The coupon rate is 8.375. So if you multiply eight, what's 8.375 percent of a thousand dollars? That's 83.75. It matures on July 15th of 2033. The trading volume for that day is out here. That's the 763,528. What's the quoted price or the ask price? That's the price right here is 100.641. So how do we know what the actual price is? For a corporate bond, uh, all you do is take this decimal place and move it one to the right. So if you go from 100 
Move that over. So this bond is selling for $1,006.41. Treasury securities are a little bit different. They have, if there are notes and bonds, here are the coupons, right? We have the ask yield or the return if you uh, buy it at the current price. Here's the, the bid price that you can sell your bonds uh, to for. And here is the ask one, which is the one that you could buy the bonds for. So again, we have 5012, 2030s when the bond matures. It has a 6.25% interest, right? The bid price is 150.7188. So what does the bid price mean? The bid price means this is what is, is essentially like the uh, wholesale price. It's what you can sell it at. The ask price is the retail price. So in this case, you could uh, purchase this for 150 point, or 150.75, or as I was saying, $1,507.50, or you could buy it at this other price. Um, how much did the price change? Here's the price change. It's up 0.8906. And again, the yield to maturity based on this ask price, if you bought this and you held it to maturity, you would earn approximately 2.713%. Um, Quoted bond prices, what we were just talking about, are referred to as clean prices. The challenge we have, though, is if you buy bonds in between interest payments, then interest has accrued to the person that owned the bond. So we have to add the interest that's owed to the owner of the bond when we purchase it from them. So how we calculate this is obviously based on the days that the bond was held. What about inflation and interest rates? How does this impact the bond market itself? Well, the real rate of interest refers to the change in purchasing power. It reflects the changes that we have when um, th there's changes in inflation. The nominal rate of interest, that's the quoted rate of interest, this also then includes this change in purchasing power and inflation, right? So we have to talk about the, how can we formalize this discussion? Well, here's how we do it. There is a, an, a, a return or a uh, hypothesis or a theory called the Fisher effect. And essentially the Fisher effect says the R rate, the R, the nominal rate of return is one plus R, that's the real rate, plus 1 plus H, which is the inflation rate. So this nominal rate, which we will ultimately call the risk-free rate, if you take these parentheses, take this number, and subtract 1 from it, take that, do this product and subtract 1, that would be the nominal rate that would incorporate the changes in inflation. So if we require a 10% real return, we expected inflation to be 8%, what's the nominal rate? Well, when you plug it in here, 1.1 times 1.08, right? It would be 18.8%. So the approximation of R is the 10%, right? Plus the 8% gives us the approximate number of 18%. And again, because the real return and inflation are relatively high, there is a big difference between the two, uh, between the Fisher effect and the nominal effect. But with lower numbers, lower real numbers and lower inflation, um, the differences won't be that, uh, that, that outrageous. So how can we find this information or how can we utilize this information? There's something called the term structure of interest rates. And the term structure is a picture of interest rates um, based on the maturity and the yields of, that, uh, of those interest rates. And I wasn't prepared to do this, so give me a half a second here to um, catch up here and I'll, I'll be, uh, we'll be right back. So 
what I wanted to show you here is actually out on Yahoo Finance what this what this looks like. So if you go to Yahoo Finance, if you go to Yahoo Finance, here we are at the website. And you want to go down here on the right left hand side, you'll see something here it says market data. When you click so on market data, it gives you an option for bonds. So click on the bonds. And what we see here is actually what we're talking about. The term structure is this table. In fact, it's really the first two columns. It represents the yield to maturity if you buy a treasury security that matures at this time frame. So right now, if you bought a 30-year treasury bond, you would earn 2.51%. Now, on the right-hand side here is what's referred to as the yield curve. The yield curve is a picture of these two columns. So it just takes the table and converts it into, um, into a picture. If we have a yield curve, right, that is upward sloping, we refer to that as a normal curve. That's what we expect to find normally. Essentially what that tells us is that long-term debt has a higher return than short-term debt. Occasionally, though, it will be inverted, that there'll be a downward slope. So what could possibly, or how is this ultimately created from where we were talking about the uh, in, uh, Fisher effect? Here's the real rate of return on an investment. Copied onto that is the inflation premium. So what adds then to this inflation premium? You see that it is a, it's an upward sloping curve because inflation does get higher as inflation goes out. But we also then have to incorporate or add any kind of interest rate risk premiums that we might have. So that ultimately gives us this nominal interest rate. So this could be cause for lots of reasons why there is an upward sloping curve, if you will. But it could be, we're just saying upward sloping means there is some interest rate risk and there is an inflation premium that is growing. We expect inflation and therefore interest rates to increase in the future. Downward sloping would be the difference. We're expecting inflation to decline. The real rate's not changing, but inflation's changing. And of course, there still could be, maybe even the same magnitude of interest rate risk. But in general, what we see then is this downward sloping curve which tells us that investors are expecting inflations, inflation and therefore future interest rates to also decline. We can look at a couple of pictures of term structure. You see, this is one year ago and whatever this date was on January 27th of 2012. And you can see that from one year to the next, the curves change. They're both upward sloping. But one year ago, the curve was higher. That means we had overall had higher interest rates over that time frame than what we did uh, in the most recent times. So again, we can look at these yield curves and make some type of a pr uh, prediction, if you will, of what we think is going to happen uh, to interest rates moving forward. So what things affect interest rates or the returns on bonds? Certainly default risk premiums. Those are typically shown to us in the bond ratings. There's a premium for taxability, right? There is a higher rate, uh, there is a higher return that's going to come to taxable debt than municipal debt because taxable debt has a taxability premium. What about a liquidity premiums? Sometimes bonds don't trade very well. They're slow traders. So bonds that have Frequent trading will have lower returns than those that have less frequent trading. Maturity premium. Longer bonds are going to tend to have higher returns than shorter bonds. So anything else that affects the risk of cash flows to the bondholders ultimately affects the required returns. And of course, if they are elements that we anticipate bad things happening, they will reduce the returns. If they have good things happening to them, then obviously returns will uh, go the opposite direction. Here I have a picture just kind of shows us. This is yield curves for different kinds of bonds. Here are treasury bonds, 
followed by triple A bonds, followed by double B, triple B bonds. If we assume that these curves fair, uh, maintain a fairly consistent distance, then we can forecast. If I can forecast treasury bonds, I can make a forecast on these, these other debts. So we, we need to be able to see these pictures and understand relatively how they move together. Um, we would typically think that stocks and bonds move in opposite directions. So when bonds are doing well, stocks are doing poorly. There are just a couple of theories of this term structure. And the first one is something called the expectations theory. Essentially, this says that the rates that we see are determined by the expectations of investors. That is, what do they think is going to happen in the future? So in this case, if you think about it, we have a, a, a theory that's called the law of one price. Two things that are identical have to have the exact same return. So if we invest in the United States government for two years, let's say we could get a 2% return. We could also invest in the United States government for one year and then for another year. So in the first year, if we earned a half a percent, again, not using the time value of money, then in the second year, we'd have to earn one and a half percent because these two investments have to have equal returns. So we can formulate investors' expectations by looking at current prices in the market. The liquidity preference just suggests the long-term rates will generally be higher than short-term rates. Why is that? Because people would rather lend short-term than long-term. So if I would rather lend to you short-term, but you want to borrow long-term, how can you get me to lend you money long-term? And the answer to that is, you would give me a higher rate of return. And finally, the market segmentation theory says that the marketplace has a great deal to do with this. There might be times when the returns, uh, when, 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 the, um, when the marketplace is in demand for middle income or middle maturity types of debt. So in this case, we're going to have a, a yield curve that represents the demand for middle debt. So it's not going to be uh, upward slope or downward slope. It's either going to have a dip in it or it could have a hump in it. So again, this market segmentation theory uh, applies the concept of supply and demand to the different maturity levels that we have in debt. So that's all we have for debt. We're going to move on to some uh, more exciting chapters in the, in the coming videos.